Okay, uh, my name is Margaret Mwenje, and I love the Lord as my personal savior. He saved me when I was a very young girl, um, in my teenage years, and I've seen his faithfulness in my life. And I usually say um, that I don't really understand what people can do without God, because our God is such a good God. Praise be to God. Um, yes, so I'm saved, and I have greetings from my family, from my husband, Reverend Dr. Mwenje. We pastor um, with the Presbyterian Church of East Africa in Kajiando, uh, but we, we stay allowed. I work in Pan Africa Christian University. That is the space that God has given me uh, for this season. Um, and Pan Africa Christian University is actually your neighbor, and we have the best programs in the world. We have, <laughs> yes, we, ha we have um, the School of Leadership, Department of Leadership, where they have leadership courses, uh, business uh, courses, and also IT and counseling psychology and actually myself i'm in counseling psychology it's an area that i love with all my heart we have marriage and family therapy we have community development criminology and security leadership all those beautiful programs and we have the best management actually where in the world can you find a vice chancellor who hugs her students and mentors them very closely in the christian discipline so um, karibuni sana pan africa christian university it is your university Praise be to God. I was told to come and talk about unspoken needs and why do we have unspoken needs? Why don't people want to talk about them? You know, when something hurts so bad, it becomes very difficult to talk about. And um, what I know and based on my experience in counseling is that when people go through some tough times, some times of painful experiences, they, they, they don't want to talk about those, the feelings that comes along those painful experiences. They pack them in a little briefcase, briefcase in the quotes. Maybe somebody loses a loved one and the pain of grief is too much. And they pack those painful experiences in the briefcase, in quotes. Then maybe you get in a relationship and this relationship is not working or maybe it breaks and all that kind of stuff. You don't want to talk about it, you just hold it. You pack it in the briefcase and briefcase in quotes because during this season of COVID-19 I think there is so much going on and there is so much pain that people are going through and some people instead of expressing that pain or talking about their experiences they introvert they, they kind of pack those feelings in the briefcase that is why they become unspoken and I want to tell you this afternoon that when people pack those feelings painful feelings painful emotions um, in the briefcase, you cannot go very far. Because as you continue, this briefcase, you will become very heavy and you get stuck. And when you get stuck, that's when you start experiencing stress, burnout, depression, and even trauma. And clinical depression. And we don't want to get there. And that's why we are here this afternoon, to know how we can be able to handle the pain instead of packing it. And, and, and I also want to mention something very quickly, that we are losing very many of our African men through stress-related illnesses. Because the way men are socialized, they are told, don't, don't show emotions, you should not cry, you should not you know, show your emotions, and you, know, you, just be, you just need to be strong. In the name of becoming strong and not expressing these emotions, they, we are having very many people who are struggling with stress-related illnesses. High blood pressure and um, diabetes and uh, stomach ulcers. You all know about stomach ulcers. It is not very interesting. It is very, very painful for those of you who have had an experience with that. And to me, based on my experience, ulcers is not about what you eat. It is about what is eating you. Did you get that? Ulcers is not about what you eat, it is about what is eating you. Because if you come to me for counseling, I will ask you, when did you start having this problem? Then you tell me two years ago. Then I ask you, the begin towards the beginning of um, 2019 or the, begin or the end of 2019, you will tell me towards the end of 2019. Then I will go further and ask you, tell me what was going on in your life towards the end of 2019. Then maybe you'll tell me that you lost a loved one, maybe you lost a job, maybe the business was not doing too good, and then I will be able to help you to take care of that unfinished business. Those unresolved issues. That is the danger of not speaking about our needs. That is the danger of packing 
our feelings in the little briefcase, it does not help. We just have to speak it out. Praise be to God. Yes, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, loss and grief. Loss and grief. Um, and, and there are some few ones that maybe, uh, maybe you can, the person who is controlling this can actually move with me. Uh, yes. There are some, speci uh, some specific definitions that I want us to understand because they will keep on coming up in my discussion. One is grief. Grief is that painful, it, it, it's actually painful, it's painful emotion or reaction to a loss of someone or something that is very, very important to the individual. We, and, and the intensity of our grief actually depends on the attachment that we had with the person that we have lost and, or, or the business or whatever that you have lost and you are grieving about it. The intensity of grief will actually depend on the attachment that you had. And that's why in a family, maybe a family of five, you may lose a loved one in that family, but then you find that there are two people who are really knocked out. There are two people who are really, really grieving. They have so much emotional pain as opposed to the others. So it all depends on the emotional attachment. All right? Then there is mourning. Mourning is what we do with those grief feelings. It is what we do, we do about, uh, you know, or with those feelings that, in that, that we have as we grieve. And that's why we talk about, you know, so-and-so is mourning the loss of a loved one or is mourning, a, you know, the loss of a relationship or mourning the loss of a business or something like that. Then there is bereavement. Bereavement is the state of being in grief. That state, that moment, you know, um, and, and in other words, we call it to be robbed. You feel like you are being robbed of a relationship. You are being robbed, you know, robbed of, a, you know, of, of, a, of, of somebody who you really cared so much about. Then there is what we call complicated grief. And the reason why it is colored in, in red, it is because this is a red zone. And we don't want any of our members, we don't want any of, our, or any of you to actually um, experience complicated grief because this is actually very bad. This is what really paralyzes you and you are not really able to move on with life. You are not able to function normally because you have lost a relationship, you have lost a loved one, you have lost a business, you are kind of paralyzed. Then there is trauma. Trauma is actually the event or the experience that is really overwhelming. And this is where you start, you hear people talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. Somebody going through a very painful experience and, uh, or, or maybe going through grief and that grief is not processed and the person kind of gets stuck in that grief, is not able to really move on and that is a danger zone, it is a red zone and we don't want anybody to get there, that's why we are here to talk about the unspoken needs and the importance of speaking them, you know, expressing them. Even if you don't talk about it, you know, I'll, let, I'll tell you what else you can do just to get them out, to unpack that briefcase that is so heavy. All right? Um, there are some few myths that some people have about grief. That if you cry, you are weak. I'm here to tell you, no, that is not true. Even Jesus cried. I think that is the, the most popular verse in the Bible that Jesus wept, right? So it's okay to cry. We should not feel embarrassed when you, know, when you cry after losing a, a relationship, after losing a loved one. It's okay to cry. It's okay. And even when we see our people crying, please let us, let us not discourage them. It's a way of emptying the briefcase. It's a way of emptying the emotions. It's a way of actually unpacking that briefcase as opposed to packing. All right? So it is okay. That is a, a myth. Something else is that we have to remain strong for others. I've seen some people lose a loved one in the family and somebody says, I have to stay strong for my children. I have to stay strong for my mother. I have to stay strong for my siblings. Or I have to be strong for everybody else. No. Everybody grieves differently. Just grieve. Express your emotions. It's okay. And you don't have to be strong for them. I have a personal experience. You know, we, we, we had a death in the family and my, my, my big brother, we call him big brother, he was like the, most, the, the strongest one, very strong, and not even shedding a tear. But then he, 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 he was struggling with unresolved grief when all of us had actually moved on. And that is when now he started feeling the, the, the pain. So it is okay. Don't be strong for anybody. Just go ahead and grieve. Express yourself. It's okay. 
another myth that we need to avoid is that you, you need to avoid talking about the loss. Don't talk about it. It's not good. No, talk about it. Don't be silent. Express these feelings. Don't pack that briefcase because it is not very interesting to walk aloud with that heavy briefcase, you know, with you. Something else is that if you are born again Christian, you know, to Meokoka, then you should not grieve. Yes, we are Christians. Yes, we are saved. Yes, we still experience the pain of grief. Is that true? We still experience that pain. And the Bible says, the Bible does not tell us not to grieve. But the Bible tells us we can grieve, but not like the non-believers who don't have hope in eternal life. But we can grieve. Something else is that you should not talk about death. No, it's not a taboo. We can talk about it. And then another myth is that children don't grieve and they don't even understand. Let me tell you, children grief but they grieve in their own way and sometimes we may ignore children as everybody else goes seeking for counseling and taking care of you know uh, the adults but they ignore the children children grieve but in their own way they have their own questions i remember when i lost my dad one of my nephews asked her mom his mom you know mom in Sunday school we were told that good people when they die when good people die they go to heaven and God is in heaven. They go to stay with God. But now, how come that grandpa was a very good man and they put him down there? They even threw soil. <laughs> they buried him down there. Yet good, he was a good man. They have their own questions. They have their own concerns. Don't ignore them when you are grieving. Don't, don't restrict them. When they want to view the body or when they want to, you know, just talk. They grieve, children grieve. So that is just a myth, okay? When we are grieving, we go through different you know, emotions. And some of the emotional uh, feelings that we do have uh, includes anxiety. We are anxious about what is going on. Is it maybe losing a business? Is it a relationship? Is it maybe losing you know, anything that is valuable to you? There is there's some feelings of anxiety. Numbness, you can feel like you are just numb. This is especially when you get the news that the business has been, you know, you, know, you have been laid off, so and so has passed on. You know, you become numb. And this is where you ask somebody, what can I do for you or what is going on? Somebody will tell you, I'm not thinking, I'm just here. They are just numb. And it is okay to feel that way because it is a normal, um, you know, emotional experience. Some people may feel angry. You may be angry at God. You may be angry at the person who has gone. You may be angry, you know, at other people that you think possibly they contributed to, to, to you know, to the death. Or people that you think they, made, they didn't take care. They didn't take proper care of this person. Or you, are, you may be angry at yourself. Asking yourself, is it... Is there anything that maybe I should have done that I didn't do? Anger, it is also another feeling. Guilt, sadness and confusion and denial, your disbelief, you know, feeling like, no, I don't really think that it happened. I don't believe it. And this is where we start saying, oh no, it has not happened. I don't believe this is happening. That is called denial. And then uh, disturbances in sleep patterns. You may find yourself either sleeping too much or not sleeping at all. That is what we call insomnia. You may also start experiencing loss of appetite. People respect, respond differently. There are some people who will eat too much when they are stressed out, and some other people will not eat at all. <laughs> that happens. It happens. And, and, and that's why when we talk about lack of appetite, for the caregivers, the friends, and the families, and people who care so much about these people who have lost their loved ones, it's very important to know that they may not have appetite, so you need to take care of them. Let them eat whatever they want to eat. Maybe just get some few bites, you know, regular like few bites and stuff like that, because this is something that they may be going through. Social withdrawal, just feeling like you just want to be alone. You don't want to be bothered. And this is actually, it's okay, just do it a little bit, but social withdrawal is not very healthy when somebody is actually grieving. And you'll talk about that. Um, this is where we need to reach out 
to this person who is actually grieving. We need to reach out to them so that they don't withdraw and end up getting stressed out, depressed, and all that kind of stuff. We need to link up with them. We need to look for them even when they withdraw and they don't want to come even to church. But you talk about that. Avoidance, avoiding talking about the person who has gone and avoiding the places that reminds you of the person who has gone and, and, and all that. That's another feeling. Okay? I want us to talk about some stages of grief. Where it all starts. And we're going to refer to somebody called Kumbla Loss. He talked about some six stages of grief that we go through. And the reason why uh, it's important to talk about these stages is because grief is not an event. It is a process. There's a difference between an event and a process. An event is something that just happens and you can't reverse it. But a process takes time. So grief is actually a process. And that's why you may lose a loved one and you find yourself still grieving after one year, after two years, three years, and all that, because it's actually a process. So the stage, you know, stage number one that he talks about is called shock and denial. This is where you hear the news that the place has been burned, or maybe so and so has passed on, or you know, something has happened, and you have lost somebody or something that you value. So it comes immediately after the loss. And this involved feeling just stunned and feeling, you know, have that feeling of shock. Feeling like you are just frozen. And it is very important for us to know what people go through so that when you go to visit somebody who has just lost something or somebody and they are not talking to you, you don't take it personally. Maybe somebody is in shock. And you just need to be there. Maybe they don't want to talk. It's okay. Just offer what we call in counseling a calm presence. It's okay. Maybe they don't want to talk because they just got the news and they are still trying to conceptualize what they have, you know, the news, the bad news that they have gotten. The person may actually, you know, start saying, oh no, it has not happened. That is called denial. And that denial can actually continue even after the bar, after, after the, the bar you, after the funeral. And there are some people who bury their loved ones and they, and they stay even for a, quite a long time still being in denial. It's like, I don't really believe that so and so went. It is not real, it didn't happen. That is called denial. And we don't want people to get stuck in that stage. We want people to move on. We don't want people to be in denial for a long time. Okay, and uh, the, the reason why we, uh, you know, we, we don't want people to get stuck in denial is because for real, it has happened. And if somebody is in denial, he might just not, he or she may not move on because you are still stuck there in denial. Okay, the next stage, and I'll tell you how to handle the denial part. The next part, uh, you know, stage is called anger. This is where somebody turns the anger in, in, in one day. You are not projecting it, but you turn it in one day. And then some people, you turn it out one day. And it is, this, this anger can be directed to the person who has died. In fact, we even hear of some people who beat the person who has died. It's like, did you have to go? And then some other people are angry at themselves. Other people are angry at God. Why did you allow this to happen? D you, you, you can, you, 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 you know, you, you are able to heal. Why did you heal so and so? Why didn't you take care of my business? Why didn't you, you saw it coming because you are the beginning and the end and you see everything, you even know the future. Why did you allow this to happen? And this can cause anger. There are some, and we don't want people to get stuck in that anger. We want people to move on. Because there are some people who get angry even at God and they say, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm not even going to pray anymore. And you feel like you are angry at God. 
And then in the family, you might also start picking somebody and you are mad at this person or you are angry towards this person who you think maybe does not care or is not mourning like everybody else. And that can cause conflicts. We have known of some relationships and some marriages that are broken after the death of a child, after the death of a parent and all that stuff because maybe they were not able to handle the anger stage. And that's why we don't want people to just be silent about this anger and all that. We want people to process these feelings so that they can be able to move on. What can you do if somebody is still in denial and if somebody is, you know, is, is actually uh, stuck with, uh, with, the, with the anger? Help this person to talk through the emotions. Or even yourself, it is you who is actually grieving. Don't be silent. Don't be silent. Talk through your emotions with a counselor or with a crossed empathic friend. Somebody who will listen to you with an understanding lens. Somebody who will listen to you with a lot of empathy and understanding a close friend. Please look for somebody. This is not the time to isolate yourself. Talk to somebody. You can even talk to a counselor. And I thank God. You know, I think this church, you are so blessed. You have counselors who really care and who are doing the best they can do in order to take care of their mental health. It's actually a blessing. Not many churches have this kind of a resource. Something else you can do, some journaling. Just lighting those emotions down. And even like today, I'm very angry at myself, I'm angry at so-and-so. Just light, light those emotions down. Remember that the reason why you are writing is just to vent out, is to empty yourself, as opposed to packing those emotions. So instead of packing, in the briefcase, you, you vent out. You talk about it with a, with a person, you talk about it with a counselor, or you just journal, light down. This helps to empty yourself instead of allowing anger and bitterness to settle because this can actually lead to emotional problems or emotional distress. Working through anger will help you to continue moving. It will help you to move on. It will help you to start processing and moving on, okay? Because remember, it is okay to express emotions. It's okay to talk about it. Don't be silent. Don't be silent. Express them. Empty yourself. Instead of bottling up those emotions and then uh, you end up struggling later in life with some emotional distress. The third stage is depression. And when we talk about depression, this is not clinical depression. In most cases, outward directed anger turns inward and it becomes depression. So the grieving person may start feeling, ang feeling guilty over being angry at God and not even praying and not going to church, you start feeling guilty. That guilt can actually resort to some emotions that can cause depression. Remember, it's not clinical depression yet. So um, you may feel guilty thinking that maybe you failed to protect the person who has passed on. Maybe there is something that you should have done and you didn't protect this person. You may start regretting and feeling guilty about what you could have done. This is called false guilt. It is false. Because maybe there is nothing that you could have done. There is nothing you could have done to save that relationship. There is nothing maybe that you could have done to prevent this person from dying. There is nothing that you could have done. Maybe you did your best. So when you start having that guilt, that one we call it false guilt. It is false guilt. It is the guilt we, guilt we feel of actions that we couldn't have for a sin or failure to do maybe what we thought you could have done to save the situation. Okay? It involves maybe self-brain about the loss that may, that may be occurred. Feeling that maybe God is punishing me or maybe something, I did something that is not right and you're just blaming yourself. Maybe it's a relationship. There are some people who get in a relationship and then relationship breaks. And you are just there. You, you have no idea what you did, but somebody has just decided to walk out. And the marriage ends or relationship ends. And you are there trying to uh, kind of blame yourself. I usually tell people, when somebody decides to walk away, because we have so many of our young people who are being killed, 
by the, the boyfriends and all that stuff. I think you have heard that, especially our university and college students. You know, somebody is not actually accepting that a relationship can end. And sometimes there are some people who will get a relationship in a relationship and it breaks and they sit in what I call a pity party in a corner that is so dusty and they are like, I don't think I'm good enough and I don't think maybe I'll, you know, um, you know uh, I'm a good person. They start looking at themselves negatively. They start thinking negatively and that can actually invite the kind of depression we are talking about. So I usually tell people, you know what, if this person was meant to stay, he could have stayed. But maybe his, his, his part in the, in the game or in the, in the, in the drama is, is done. And that is why this person has gone. I know it is not easy. Possibly you had invested a lot of, info, you had in, engaged a lot of emotional investment. It is, it is painful, yes. It is painful. And that's why people grieve even after losing a relationship. But it's also important to know that if this person has given you maybe a slap on the face and has moved on, has continued with life, and yourself, you are still sitting in the pity party with the all poor me mentality, and in the pity party, by the way, there is no sweet cake. <laughs> it's a very dull party. And you are sitting there in that dust. You are being unfair to yourself. This person was unfair to you, definitely. And you're also being unfair to yourself. It's very important to just get up, brush the dust off, and move on. If they were meant to stay, they could have stayed. Praise be to God. Um, let, let's, keep, let's keep moving. Um, this kind of depression is a temporary, is kind of a temporary stage in a normal uh, you know, process uh, in recovery. And some of the symptoms of this kind of depression may involve disturbed, thank you, may involve disturbed sleeping patterns, lack of motivation to, to perform tasks, just feeling like you, you are literally putting yourself out of bed. You don't have any energy. You are feeling tired, you are feeling fatigued and you don't have any joy and also crying just feeling crying just feeling sad and feeling like you are hopeless having feelings of hopelessness and helplessness that is the depression but the problem is this depression is not clinical but if you are not if you don't take care of yourself if nothing is actually done it is possible to sleep deeper into clinical depression. That is the danger. So if, if nothing is done around this time, you are still in that state of stuckness, then you are likely, very likely, to get into clinical depression, where you need to be referred to a hospital to see a psychiatrist, and then you'll be put on antidepressant medication. But we don't want you to get there. That's why we want you to explore grief and empty yourself and talk about it. Talk about it. Let's talk about it. Grief depression stage can take up to two or even three years. Some people struggle with it for such a long time. But as long as they are still working on the, on the grief, they are still trying to process and maybe you have some help. For some people who have some support, Maybe you have some support, you are, there, there's some friends, or maybe you are talking to a counselor and all that kind of stuff. They are helping you to process the grief. There are some people who actually get over it even sooner. And that's why I say that people grieve differently and at, they, they are at different stages, even if maybe they are in a family and they have lost a common family member. So if the person remains emotionally paralyzed, withdrawn and unfunctional, then they can slide to clinical depression. And that is what we want to avoid at all costs. We know of some people who have actually lost it. They have become mentally ill. They have become depressed and even suicidal after losing a loved one, after losing a business, after losing a relationship. And we don't want our people to get there. That's why we need some support, psychological support. It's very important. Okay. 
Um, then after the depression stage, you go to the bargaining stage. This is where you try to look back and you start bargaining with God. And you start telling God some things like, how can I get over this? God, please just help me get over this. I'm tired. I'm sick and tired of being in this kind of a situation, of being in this kind of a state. Just help me, God. Now you are not angry at God anymore, but now you are negotiating with God. You are bargaining with God. It's like you are tired and you want to move on. Anybody who has ever felt that way? Anybody? Now it's like, God, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I know I... I said I wouldn't even pray to you. I know I was mad at you, God. I know I said I'm not even going to church, but now, God, I'm back. I'm coming back. <laughs> I'm coming back, God. Help me out. Just help me out. Help me to move on. Help me to help this pain to go away. You start kind of bargaining. And our God is so good. Even when we are mad, He understands. You remember Mary and Martha. Mary kind of confronted Jesus. Where were you when my brother was sick? You could have healed him. It's like, what took you so long? She was angry, but later she was okay. So you start negotiating. God just take, take away these feelings because it's not very interesting to, you know, to encounter, I mean, to continue in these kind of feelings. Not very interesting. Then once you are able to let go, you get to the sadness stage. And the sadness, you know, this is normal, a normal consequence of letting go of the bargaining. It becomes clear that the situation is not going to change. The business is gone. This person for real is not coming back. The relationship is gone. It has broken. He's not coming. There's no turning back. And even somebody who has lost a loved one, you get to a to realization, the realization that this person really has gone. He's not coming back. He's not coming back. And that letting go, it will be accompanied by some kind of sadness. You start feeling sad. And this sadness is still okay. You will find yourself shedding tears. And it's okay. The funeral has already been done and some people have moved on, but you find yourself going back to that kind of sadness. And it is okay to feel that way. It's still okay. Um, next, um, we get to the last stage, and we want everybody to get here. This is what we want people to actually attain. That is forgiveness, resolution, and acceptance. But this may take long. And this is actually the goal for anybody who is actually grieving, to get there. But it's very important to know that even when you come to acceptance, you still have some moments because the emotions don't travel on a straight line. They travel on a zigzag line. You find yourself kind of riding a roller coaster. You find yourself sometimes feeling sad. But that sadness will not be so intense and it may not take long before it just comes down. It's like you are getting better with time. Maybe you, you didn't feel like, like visiting home. Maybe you didn't really feel like talking about that person, but now you start feeling you are kind of okay. You have started to move on and you are kind of healing. But still, you will be having some little moments, but these moments will not be so painful like before. Okay? Now, I want us to talk about what we need to do. What do we need to do? What is it that we need to do? in order to support other people and to support ourselves. How to support people who are going through grief. And as I talk about how to support people, also think about yourself, how you need to support yourself, though we are going to talk about that later. Offer your calm and supportive presence. Just be there for the person who has lost a loved one, for the person who, has, who is going through grief, or the person who is mourning, this is the time to reach out. I think it's also biblical. The Bible says that we need to grieve with those who are grieving and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Praise be to God. We need to connect with the people who are grieving. If you don't know what to say, say nothing. Some people, I've had many people ask me, 
I don't know what to tell my friends. I, I don't even know. I would like to help. I would like to say something, but I don't even know what to say. By the way, if you don't know what to say, say nothing. Just offer your calm present. Just being there. Maybe just giving them a hug is, is, is enough. Maybe just fixing a meal or just taking a meal. It is good enough. Just being there so that they can know that somebody cares and, somebody, and, and they are not alone. Encourage the grieving person to talk about the, you know, talk about the loss, to express their feelings, as opposed to bottling up these emotions, as opposed to keeping quiet about the pain, as opposed to packing the feelings in the briefcase. Encourage them to talk about. And you can ask them some leading questions like, how, how, what happened? How did you get the news? But if they want to talk, let them talk. If they want maybe to talk a little bit and then just be quiet and they don't want to talk about it, it is still okay. Just be there for them. Your presence is, more impo is very important. Encourage the person to share the memories, maybe about the person who has, who has gone, or maybe about the business that has, you know, that, that has, um, you know, burnt or something, or a relationship and all that. Listen to the person non-judgmentally. You know, just listen, just pay attention. And the reason why I'm saying this is because there are some people who will actually attend uh, the prayers and just disappear. And then they leave the grieving person alone. We need to be there for them. We need to work with them. It is very, very important at this particular moment when they are grieving. Okay? Um, next slide, maybe someone can help me out. Um, okay. Encourage the grieving person to stay connected, connected to the support system. This is very, very important. Being connected to a sub support system. Even in church, you can actually have a group, support group for people who have lost their loved ones. A support group for people who are going through the same kind of a situation. And when you have this kind of a group, just join together. You can just be four people, five people, and you have gone through the same kind of a situation. You have walked in the same shoes. And as you talk, you can be able to relate with each other. You can be able to exchange ideas. How are you coping? Then somebody can tell you, you know what? For me, I'm really feeling stuck. Then the other person may tell you, you know, I was feeling that way, but this is what I did, and I'm able to cope. This support group is very, very important. And also the family and the friends. This is not the time for the social distancing. <laughs> this is not the time for, for staying away from people, for isolating yourself. Because if you isolate yourself, the depression can catch up with you very, very quickly. Okay? Encourage the person to maintain healthy routines. That is functioning, the friendships. There are some people who might think, I don't really need to be allowed anybody. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want visitors. I don't want to interact with people. If it is your friend, please try to connect with this person. Don't allow them to isolate themselves. Even if they don't want to talk, it's okay. Just be there for them. It's very, very important. You can just pick the, pick the kids and just, you know, take them out. You can take this person out, just go eat and then come back. Or you can just cook for them. You can just go stay with them, but don't leave them in isolation. It is a dangerous zone. Okay? Any kind of support that the person may need, offer it. If you feel like you are really overwhelmed and you don't really know what to do to support this person, it's your friend, it's a relative, you want to support them but you don't know what to do, please defer them. Refer them to a, to, to a professional counselor. And I, I know, you know, Pastor Anne, you know, she's actually, I know she's a very good counselor. I refer grants to her and she's, she's doing a very good job. And I know you also have counselors in this sanctuary and, you know, you guys are doing a good job. May the Lord bless you. So please refer, you know, your, your people who might be grieving to uh, some support uh, system. If you feel you can't be able to help them, just refer them to people who can help them out. Be available be available to the grieving person. Not just for the few days, but as long as they need you during that journey as they process their grief. Actually, some people are very much fond of saying, if you need me, please call me. And then you leave your telephone number. As a matter of fact, they won't call you. Have you ever been told that way by somebody? If you need me, please call me. If you need anything, please, tell, please call me. Have you ever been told that? Please call me if you need anything. They won't call. They are going through stuff. They won't call you. 
So it's very, very important for you to call them. Reach out to them. My time is up. <laughs> um, yeah, reach out to them. Reach out to them. Don't just say you'll be called. I want very quickly to talk about some survival skills or uh, how you can, how a grieving person can use some little bit of tips in order to survive this journey. First of all, don't be ashamed to express your emotions. Hello? Whether you are a lady, whether you are a gentleman, it doesn't matter how you are socialized, don't be ashamed of expressing your emotions. Talk about them. If you want to cry, it's okay. Go ahead and cry. If you don't want people to see you cry, just go rock yourself in the bedroom and cry. Cry out. Just cry. But express your emotions. Talk to a, a, a friend. Talk to a counselor. Talk to your pastors. Find a support system, especially in church. That support is very, very important. Even Jesus, when he visited the, the house of Martha and, and Mary, when he went to visit there. He didn't find Mother and Mary alone. There was a support system. There was a support system there. And that's why they even helped to roll, out the, to roll away the stone. Please talk to somebody or engage in a support system. Take good care of yourself. Eat properly. Rest and keep a routine. This is not the time to refuse to eat. Just eat. Even if you don't feel like eating much, just grab something. It is very important, this part of self-care. Take care of yourself. Because remember, your life has to continue. There are still some people who need you. There are still some children or maybe some, some loved one who need you. So please take care of yourself. It is very, very important. And sometimes I usually say, if you don't take care of yourself, who will? Nobody, maybe. So in, uh, take care of yourself. I'm almost done. Something else, slow down slow down know your limits and cut on the number of things that you may try to do each day especially if you feel like you are being rushed if you feel like you are biting more than you can chew if you bite more than you can chew you are likely to choke during this time of grief please don't try to do a lot of stuff don't try to bite more than you can chew it is not a normal season but you'll get over it. Slow down. Don't, don't try to do a lot. Let people, allow people to support you. Allow people to help you out. Say goodbye. And this can actually help you to break through denial. Saying goodbye. Many people find it very difficult, I mean very difficult to say goodbye. But I'm telling you it is comforting, it is okay. Just look at that person who has gone and say goodbye. There are some people who you avoid to go there. Maybe it's a, it's a business that has been burnt down and you don't even want to go. It's okay to visit that place. It's okay to go. And sometimes if you feel like you don't want, you don't want to go alone, grab somebody and go. It is very important. It will help you to break through denial and accept that for real, this thing has happened. So it's good to say goodbye. Some people will even write a goodbye letter. Some people you just do journaling. Just to look for a way of letting go and accepting that for you it has happened. Even after the funeral, you can still go back and place a flower. Maybe when the place was so crowded and there were so many people, you didn't get an opportunity of really planting the flower that you'd love to plant. You can still go back there. You can still visit that place. But there are some people who you'll be tempted to stay away. And the more you stay away, if you are still in denial, you might get stuck in that grief process, which is not healthy. Um, the next thing that maybe you can do to survive that season, avoid making major decisions. Don't make major decisions because around this particular time, you, you, are, you, know, you have some mixed emotions. If maybe you have lost like a spouse, Avoid getting involved in a romantic uh, you know, a relationship very quickly. Give yourself some time to heal so that you don't transfer those, uh, you know, the unfinished grief to the next uh, relationship. So give yourself some time. If maybe it's a business that has broken, don't make a major decision of relocating 
First of all, give yourself some time. If maybe it's a relationship that has broken, don't lash into getting into another relationship. Give yourself time. There are some people who also lose, uh, you know, like babies, you lose a child, and then you, you, very quickly you want to get another one so that you can try to forget the grief. Give yourself time to grieve over this child who has gone. And once you are okay, then be ready to get the other one, also as the Lord leads. So don't make major decisions when you are grieving. Give yourself time to heal so that you can make objective decisions. Stay involved with family and friends. It's very important. Make an effort to reconnect with familiar routines and interests. Even after the funeral, after, after the breakup, after all these things, try to um, reconnect with some familiar routines. This will help you to start moving on. It will help you to start moving on, you know, uh, instead of feeling stuck. You can travel, you can visit some places that you have always wanted to go. You can go for a retreat, just retreating. And this is actually a very good way of even taking care of stress, you know, stress management, retreating. It's very, very important. You can just retreat. Or you can just take a friend, you just go away, just to get away from the situation giving yourself a break. Taking a break is very, very important. You will get some time to, uh, to refill your emotional oil gauge. You know, when we talk about refilling, when you are driving a vehicle and you see the oil gauge going to E, what comes to mind? That you need to do what? You need to refill, isn't it? And so when you see that oil gauge going to E, in counseling, the way I look at it is that that is going to emotional exhaustion. You are getting emotionally exhausted. And if you are getting emotionally exhausted, you need to refill. You need to refill. Hello? Yes. Otherwise, you will get stuck at the middle of the highway of life. You need to refill. And retreating is one way to refill. Connecting with support staff. I mean support, you know, support groups and uh, you know, support systems, it can help you to refill so that you can stay strong because life has to continue. You are still alive and God has kept us alive because we still have a purpose to fill. So let's just look for a way to move on. You can also learn to start doing things by yourself like paying the bills. Maybe the person who has left is the one who used to take care of all the bills. He is the one person who used to take care of children. You know, uh, you know, take kids to school and take care of everything. I remember when my dad passed on, my mom was literally paralyzed. You know, she didn't, she, she didn't really care much about, it's not that she didn't care, but dad was taking care of almost everything about the, the, the bank issues, the finances and hospitals and all these things. But she had to start learning. So it is very, we encourage people to start learning how to do things by themselves as a way of continuing with life because life has to continue. So learn to do things by yourself. For example, paying bills and taking kids to school and all that kind of stuff. By doing that, you start having a sense of mastery. Sense of mastery and sense of moving on. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, then something else that you need to do, you can start journaling. Remember, we are looking for a way of venting out. We are looking for a way of expressing ourselves. We are looking for ways of emptying that briefcase as opposed to carrying a very heavy briefcase that is packed with emotions. So we are looking for any avenue. So if you can talk about it, you can write it down, you can do journaling, it is very, very important. And uh, just looking for anything that will help you uh, express your feelings as opposed to bottling, uh, you know, bottling up the emotions. I usually tell people, you can even start doing what we call ecotherapy. Ecotherapy is where you just heal by nature. Walking along Kandukarura forest and enjoying the, the birds singing, that is very therapeutic. Going to the park and just walking, you are healing by nature. You can also just plant some few, have some few plants, watering them and taking care of them. It is called ecotherapy and it is very, very important. It can help you heal as you continue in this journey of, uh, you know, grief. Then treasure, memories, and momentous. 
There are some people, once they lose some loved ones, they throw away the pictures. They don't want anything that reminds them of the person who has died. I usually tell people, please don't throw these things away. A time will come when you'll be looking for these pictures and you'll not find them. Even if you don't want to look at them around that time, pack them, put them in a box and hide, and hide them somewhere if you don't want to see them. But a time will come when you start looking for these pictures and the person is gone, you'll not be able to take pictures with this person anymore. So don't throw them away, but you can, you can still... Um, you know, don't throw them away, but at, you know, you can start just as you heal. You can start looking at them and you start celebrating the memories and start even, sometimes even you get to a point where you can even start laughing about some, some memories, some things that you did. And some people will try to stay away, but that's why we talk about um, memorial services. But you don't latch this out. Don't latch into doing the memorial, the unveiling of the cross and all that kind of stuff. Because if people are still grieving and the grief is so intense, give yourself some time. This does not have to be done after one year. It can even be done after two years or even three years. It is still okay, depending on the level of grief that people may be going through, may, may be at. Okay? And then, this is something I found many people do. Transform your pain into helping other people, into supporting other people who are going through what you went through. In this case, you'll be like what we call a wounded healer. You have been wounded. By the grace of God, you have healed. You, have been, you, are, you, are, you are feeling better. You are healed. Now you minister. You administer healing to other people who are going through what you went, what you went through. And you can even start like a support group. You know, I have a friend who was diagnosed with, uh, you know, with cancer. And uh, by the grace of God, she's able to get over it and she's doing very, very well. And she has started a, a support group, you know, for other people who have gone through that, you know, that kind of pain and that kind of a journey. And that helps her a lot. It is very therapeutic to her. And it's also helping other people who are going through that unfamiliar journey. Finally, meditation and prayer. The Lord of all comfort, he's a comforter. He's our shield. He's our defense. He will renew our strength when our strength is gone. He's next continuing upon God, even as we go through grief, because our God is a good God. Praise be to God. He says, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. He will renew our strength, even when we don't have any strength remaining. He will be our shield and our defense. When there is darkness, he will be our light and our salvation. Praise be to God. He's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And as believers, we have hope beyond the grief. And we know that all things happen for good. Sometimes we look for the good and we can't see the good. <laughs> but everything is planned by the Almighty God. And things will happen, but nothing catches God by surprise. So I wish you all the best. May the Lord God bless you. May he continue strengthening you. And for those of you who might have lost a loved one or some things or a relationship and all that, may the Lord of all comfort come through for you. May he strengthen you. May he bless you and give you the joy of salvation. His masses are new every morning and his grace is sufficient and his love is eternal. God bless you all.